I do want to begin by thanking everyone who did so much work for this conference. In my case, a particular thanks to Atina and also to Sky. I'm especially grateful to have had the chance to think about George Mossy's work again, work that I was introduced to many decades ago by another historian who was also born in Berlin in 1918, and that was Annalisa Timme. I want to thank as well our three speakers, Adi, Ari, and Ari, for their really fascinating papers. And I can tell you their papers were even better in the longer versions, some of them quite a bit longer, uh, that I read. So quite a few things in my comments you won't have heard. You have to trust me that they're in there. Um, and I also want to say a special word of thanks to Sunny because it's been really a pleasure to discuss these papers with you. And I have to tell you that Sunny and I are sharing the commentator role. I'm going to start with some general comments about the three papers with a particular focus on Adi Gordon's paper. And Sunny is going to continue with more detailed comments about Ari Dubnov and Adi Amran's paper. So I want to suggest three themes that maybe we can discuss more or maybe our uh, presenters want to think about um, as they prepare their papers for the publication. The first is the theme of irony. In his paper, Adi Gordon provides, I think, a really valuable insight about George Moss's use of ridicule, the grotesque, as playing a reassuring exorcistical function. You simplified it to exercise. A reassuring exorcistical function. I was curious in thinking about the latter part of your paper, if there's ever any trace in Moss's discussion of his own sense of belonging in Israel, of nationalism in Israel, of that use of ridicule, or does that particular form of distancing completely fall away? Because I was struck by the contrast between Ernst Gellner's self-mocking description of playing his harmonica and weeping with alcohol and Moss's rather different way of positioning himself literally as Hannah Arendt in the exchange with Gershom Scholem with the additional twist that he had an ex extra level of self-awareness but no self-mockery. Uh, Thinking of the theme of irony, I revisited Ari Dubnov's paper and was struck by how when we enter the sphere of commemorative culture, we really enter an irony-free zone. But I wondered whether paying some additional attention to irony, to the fact that when poems or other writings become enshrined in kind of popular piety, they are always just a hair's distance away from satire and farce. I myself went to a boarding school, and I can tell you I know this from experience. Every text that is recited multiple times very, very quickly becomes the object of farce. So I thought Paul Fussell certainly is very well aware of this factor, as was Wilfred Owen. Perhaps that irony deserves more attention. Now, Adi Amrin's paper, again, I'm not sure if you could catch this, but in reading it, it's clear that the paper is actually completely structured like an extended joke. A joke whose punchline actually is us, the historians sitting in this room who for all our time and effort have much less impact than the son of Ben Sion Netanyahu. I found this um, a very, what can I say, um, you know, dark joke. But I also wondered whether the joke in this case also plays the exorcistical function that um, Adi Gordon introduced for us. And if so, does it help? Does the joke help in this reassuring or exercising way? The second theme that I wanted to bring out is a theme that's really pretty strong in all of the papers, and that's the theme of fathers and sons, fathers and sons. And again, to start with Adi Gordon's paper, it changed a little bit the ending, but the phrase still comes up, something like, it all goes back to the forced migration at the age of about 15. And I was thinking about the way that for George Mossy, the loss of fatherland was also tied up with the loss of protection of a father, of a father for all his power and wealth who was unable to protect and buffer his son. 
But I also thought of the way that this narrative of loss, of family, of belonging, also was part of a narrative of the unleashing of enormous, enormous creativity, but a creativity tied up with intense loneliness. And I wondered, in that storyline, is there any room for women? I thought about this in another context with Raoul Hilbert, but I don't want to discuss that now. And thinking about this question, again, and revisiting the other papers, I thought about the way that Adi Amran's paper, with its emphasis on fathers and sons, and very beautiful, the tribute especially to your grandfather, I found extremely moving. But the father and son pair of the Netanyahu's, the ideological fathers, the founding fathers, is literally interrupted at only one point by the presence of a woman, Anita Shapira. She disappeared in the shortened version. Ari Dubnov's paper, also very, very centrally in the longer version, which you didn't hear, features fathers and sons, in particular, the story of the binding of Isaac, which appears in multiple different forms in that extended paper. And he shows how the bereaved family, the bereaved family, so including mothers as well, brings about, I think, a significant change in the Israeli culture of commemoration from this father-son sacrifice model to a bereaved family model. Here, too, I was so interested in the ways in which women, the presence of women, actually disrupt the narrative. And Ari Dubnov, your paper was especially interesting because in the longer version, you mentioned it repeatedly. I'm not quite sure what to do with Keita Kolvitz. I need to do more with gender here. But a lot of this fell out. Yehudit Hendal, Shula Melet, the IDF commanding officer, a woman who was implicated in the death of Melet's son. It made me wonder whether the role of women in Israeli culture and in the culture of commemoration actually marks one of the key differences from the European traditions that you sort of sketch out and that Mossy himself maybe hinted at when he said, often code for women, that Israeli commemoration was more personal than public. Third theme, very quickly, the theme of Nazis. Again, I think Adi Gordon's paper really helpfully emphasizes that it was national socialism that was the horizon for Moss's reflections on nationalism. And Nazis, I think, really haunt all three of these analyses, the people in them, and also my own frame. So I just have one question for Adi Gordon, which becomes even more interesting because in your longer paper, you asked, what do we do with Moss's analysis of Hans Bluer and the Männerbund? And I thought, oh, maybe there's something about the Nazi horizon to be said there. But in fact, Hans Bluer also fell out of the shortened version of your paper. Now, in Ari Dubnov's paper, Nazis pop up everywhere, literally in the uniform of the Egyptian military. But what struck me, and again, I'm sorry, you didn't get this part, but it's really interesting, was how you chose to end the longer version of the paper with a quote from the memoir of Ariel Hirschfeld that included this sentence, I would not have been born if he had not died. I know in that sentence that Hirschfeld was referring to his brother, who was killed in 1948. But read through my eyes as a historian of the Holocaust, and with Adi Gordon's reminder of Mossy's frame of National Socialism and the Holocaust, it sounded to me like this sentence, I would not have been born if he had not died, could be read as a sort of cautionary tale of the dangers of too tightly entangling the Holocaust in the Israeli culture of commemoration. Thanks. And I want to echo Doris in thanking the panelists, um, no less the organizers, for the opportunity to respond today. And, and I will be brief. Um, and one could summarize the panels as three answers to a question that Ari Dubnov posed, namely, what are the lessons we may draw from Mossy's work when studying Jewish-Israeli history? Or put otherwise, how did Mossy write the history of Zionism? So per Adi Gordon, with what affective relationship? And per Adi Armon and Ari Dubnov, with what interpretive agenda, insights, or blind spots? 
So indeed, what Armon has shown us for today is that Mossy was an engaged, and I'm going to use the word activist, reader of the Zionist icon Max Nordau. When Nordau published his infamous Degeneration in 1892, he offered a socio-medical critique of all things decadent, which in his view corrupted and weakened the modern European man, a critique he explicitly extended towards Jews in his subsequent elaboration, Muscul Judentum, or Muscular Jewry. As Adi has shown us, Norda's work was a major touchstone for all shades of Zionism at the turn of the century. Yet while Norda would fall out of fashion after World War I for being too European, I'm using your words here, too bourgeois, too buttoned up, too exilic, he remained iconic for right-wing Zionists such as Ben Sion Netanyahu. For Masi, as a result, he had to be re-read against the Netanyahuan model not as a thinker of the right, but as someone who sought to recoup bourgeois liberalism. To quote Adi, both historians needed Nordau. Netanyahu needed Nordau to justify his demand for his new Jew, one who advocated military expansion and aggressive Zionism. In defending Nordau against Netanyahu, Masi also seems to recuperate a vision of the new Jew, this version to be read as bourgeois, dignified by the ability to quote, put down roots, but also whose nationalism extended to a love of all humanity, a model, in other words, of liberal respectability, as well as respect for individuality. Norda was also a touchstone, albeit far less prominent, in, again, this mythical longer version of the paper, uh, of Dumov's paper, where he tells us that Norda was disinterred from his gravesite in Paris to be reburied in Trimpledor Cemetery in Tel Aviv, a cemetery itself loaded with mass iconic potential. And this was part of the second of five components, the necrogeography of the cultures of commemoration in Israel that Dubnov outlines in an effort to examine how Mossy's claims for commemorative practices in Israel map onto the historical and literary record. So in Mossy's three-part claim, he explains Israeli commemoration, like its European counterpart, is primarily tied to the performance of masculinity. But in contrast, it's, quote, less militaristic, and, quote, more private. As he explains in his analysis of the cemetery at Mount Herzl, quote, despite the use of traditional national symbols, in most cases, individuality is preserved at the very bone of the way the nation presents itself, end quote. Yet as Dubnov has demonstrated, commemorative practices in Israel have been homogenizing in very public affairs, intimately tied up with icons of military grandeur and often involving women's voices. So for Dubnov, however, I would say the goal is not to say Mossy was right here and wrong there, but rather it's to use Mossy's evaluation of European culture as a heuristic tool for establishing a paradigm of Zionist memorial practices. So hearing to these two papers together, though, I want to ask you, Ari, whether the paper you've presented reveals less about Israeli commemorative practices and more about Mossy's interpretive horizons. Namely, as he seems to suggest in this introduction to fallen soldiers in Hebrew, Israeli commemorative practices accord with the vision of a new Jew. And here recall Adi's guidance on the subject. Mossy defends the Nordaunian Jew as private, individual, yet still, belonging to na yet still devoted to national belonging. So I'd like you to reflect on how your paper could be read not as Mossy as guide, but as subject. What does your work tell us about Mossy on Zionism, and is his idealized Israeli the new Jew? Or is his new Jew only an idealized Israeli engaged in commemorative practices? And Adi, if we take seriously the fact that Mossy seemed to have recouped, I would say, a new Jew to mobilize against uh, Netanyahu, and I'm here reading Netanyahu as a substitute for Jabotinsky at all, what does that mean for mapping the distance between Masi and Netanyahu? To clarify, if Masi allows for a positive project of the new Jew, then that means there has to be an imagined old Jew. And then, there, so there has to be a stereotypically flawed foil. So after hearing your paper, I wonder if you would speculate further on what we should take away from this comparison you've created. Should we feel uncomfortable with the proximity between the liberal figure of Mossi and the decidedly illiberal figure of Netanyahu? Is there a space for recuperation of the Mossi and New Jew, and why or why not? And finally, I would ask all three papers to respond to a refined version of the question with which I began not what are the general lessons we may draw from Mossy's work when studying Jewish and Israeli history, but what are the lessons we may draw about Mossy's Zionism from his work on Israeli and Jewish history.
And at this point, um, now that you have a lot to, to think through, we actually have a, a, a nice amount of time. So what I'd like to do is collect three questions um, and then offer our, respond, our panelists a chance to respond. Thank you. And I think the microphone will come around. It looks like we have actually a nice grouping of three right there, so we can play past the microphone. Uh, thank you, Ari Dubnov. Just one question. Um, so may maybe one of the features of Israel's uh, uniqueness or difference from Moses' story is that uh, many of the fallen soldiers were actually members of um, paramilitary organizations, very different ones, that in some moment, in some ways, were also fighting each other. Uh, so I was wondering whether you could say something about uh, both the state's uh, appropriation of this uh, interwar enmity and also the bottom-up element of it and whether commemoration was, um, was a, just a continuation of, of pre-state Jewish political strife by other means. Thank you for the three really fascinating uh, papers and for the even as fascinating uh, comments and uh, really uh, thought-provoking. Um, I have questions to uh, Armon and to Dubnov. Uh, I'll go with the surnames. Um, in, in what you presented, uh, Net Ben Sion's Netanyahu interpretation of uh, Nordau, it's, I was wondering if there's a dynamic, if there's a development, especially from 31 to 38, from a, a more sort of liberal, conservative, no doubt, to a more militant, nationalistic, if there's something there that can make this story into a more uh, dynamic story of uh, uh, no doubt's image in the revis revisionist uh, um, vision. And uh, a question to Dubnov, uh, Two questions. One, which is also concerned with maybe Moses' blind spot, and that's East Europe. In what way the Israeli commemoration practices, and that goes to uh, Bergen's uh, uh, pointing to the women's role, has more to kind of resonance with Soviet uh, uh, ideas of uh, commemoration of the woman, the wife, the mother, the sister waiting for the soldier, crying for the soldier, the Mother Russia, all these sort of more feminine commemorative uh, role uh, that concentrating on German Central European or English, English in Fran France might miss uh, in a way. And the second is about the different uh, party lines in commemorative. And I thought about Yad Vashem vis-a-vis -vis Har Herzl, the way the Har Herzl is more in front, that's something you see from the street where Yad Vashem is somewhat hidden uh, behind, whereas in uh, Yad Mordechai you see a sort of a, the way the Shomer Atzair kind of envision the continuation between our fight against the Egyptian and uh, the ghettos, the rebellion. So is there something that can make it even more complicated along party lines? Thank you for fantastic papers and a great summary, um, inspiring questions. <clears throat> You're all focusing on nationalism, actually, in terms of a secular uh, religion or civil religion. Um, my question <clears throat> um, is, in a way, um, a changing of the conference title, Moses Europe uh, <clears throat> And um, I'm interested here in uh, Moses Israel. Uh, and I also would like to um, append the sentence by saying, can it be saved? Um, and here I focus on the question of secular religion. Uh, I think um, Moses died um, and could not witness two, um, at least two new uh, fundamental changes. The last being a, a very strong resurgence of uh, religion. Of course, um, also secular nationalism as a uh, religion um, is, is an irony-free zone of pathos, and religion uh, <clears throat> has this in common with uh, nationalism. 
But uh, the, the fact that um, religion comes in uh, seems to be important as an element that really changes the chemical um, makeup uh, of the nation. Of course, that was never um, a concern for Mosse, but maybe it can be a concern for us. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, thank you for all the wonderful question. I'll try to answer them briefly. Um, the joke, uh, it's more, more exactly like a call, perhaps to be more engaged. Um, the Mosse program is very close to that, I think. But maybe it can go even broader. The Mosse mission can go beyond the academic world to reach a wider audience. Uh, Netanyahu, the Netanyahu is, did it very well, the father and the son. After uh, Yoni Netanyahu died in 1976, the two, the father and the son, Ben Sion and Benjamin, established a think tank uh, called Mahon Yonatan, Yonatan Institute. They publish Yoni's letters, and they also organize a conference, the war against terror, very early uh, use of the war against terror terms, uh, making the sun an expert of terror. Um, women, Anita Shapira is included, and she's very important because Mossi uh, was not an expert of Jabotinsky or the right wing. He had an opinions of them, but he was not an expert. And he refers in his article to Shlomo Avineri and to Anita Shapira, Land and Power, Cher in Hebrew, both books, uh, Avineri's the, uh, books on design idea and Anita Shapira's were published, like uh, Arik mentioned, following the first Lebanon war, the Intifada, they had a lot of criticism. Avineri write an article against Jabotinsky describing him as almost fascist. Um, Anita Shapira deals with Zionism and force and kind of describe a gradual uh, development of aggressiveness in uh, Zionist thinking and praxis. Uh, and also Max Noder's reception itself was very, owe a lot to women. Uh, what the biography was written by a female, by a mem fem female member. So it's very, very, uh, they have a very important role. And the dynamics of Nodo um, I th in, exist less in the revisionist thought, but more in Moss's thought, why he felt an urge to defend uh, Nodo against the revisionist Zionist. There is a kind of a dynamic, and the dynamic, I think, is the context. He wrote, uh, it wrote it for the conference 100 years for the generation that he was held in, Paris, in France. And um, he wrote it following the more than a decade years of right-wing rule, uh, just before the election um, where Rabin and the Labour uh, Party won. Um, and Israel, Moses Israel, can it be saved? Uh, I think that the answer is no, uh, but uh, the question is one can postpone the end, and it can be postponed uh, maybe with the help of most liberal Zionism, or at least the ideal. And um, yeah, and Mosse was critical toward Nordo and ambivalent toward him and toward Zionism, but he was more ambivalent, uh, more, more critical toward the interpretation of the revision of Nodo by the revisionists. Um, he thought that the revisionist interpretation distorts not only Nodo's uh, writings, but also Zionist itself. So uh, I think that in this particular and peculiar case, uh, Nodo went back to defend the 19th century, which is very critical, in order to save it and Zionism from the interpretation that was given to it in the 20th century. Um.
Yeah, thank you for the question and for the uh, really wonderful comment, uh, uh, Doris. I think that you really captured the holy trinity of Israeli culture, jokes, Oedipal tensions, and Nazis. Um, but, uh, um, but more seriously, I think that, that there, you raise a lot of, 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 of extremely important questions that are tied to, to some of the questions that came from the floor. I'll try to combine them somehow. Um, um, that are connected to dynamics of um, uh, inclusion and exclusion, both of women, but also of, of, uh, of the other ideological streams that do not uh, 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 rhyme well with what is the exact labor Zionist hegemony that in the early years was creating the pantheon, in later years was writing the books. Um, so there's, so um, I'll try to, to, to connect, I mean, so if there are dynamics of exclusion and inclusion, they're connected to, to gender uh, inclusion and exclusion, to the exclusion of, of the East European. So that's, of course, that's, not, that's well known, but uh, uh, the war in 1948, the Gachal Gius Chutzlarts, which is predominantly either Holocaust survivors or North African Jews, comprise a significant, you know, uh, between a quarter to a third of the Israeli army at the end of the war. They are not represented, not visually, not in any way, in the iconography or what I call necrography of the war. It's even interesting for the Israeli cultural critics that to take someone like Arik Lavi, who is a classic example of someone who fabricates, that creates his image as a sabra. He's not a sabra. But it's important to, to demonstrate that you're the young Israeli labor Zionist Sabra because you're always suntanned. You came from the from working in the fields of the kibbutz and this dual meaning of from the battlefield from the field of the agricultural field into the battlefield is very important in the labor Zionist uh, uh, modes of commemoration is 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 also part of the exclusion and and absolutely I mean thank you for 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 I mean of course the paramilitary groups and this is you know, ties it to, to so uh, extremely well with Adi Armand's paper, there's a really deep sense of, of, uh, of betrayal that came from, uh, um, from the um, uh, paramilitary groups that were associated with revisionist Zionists, whether this is a Lehi or the Etzel, and that are not the same ideologically. So they, in the labor Zionist mind, they're both right-wing fascists. They are themselves more complicated than this, but it was very important for the state authorities not to recognize them. And it's very uh, illustrative that one of the first things that Begin will do when he would come to power is kind of a revive the debate about why didn't the state give, the state recognize the paramilitary fighters of the Palmach and the Haganah and, and handed them uh, um, um, medals, why do rec you do not recognize, of course, begging it's myself, but also my comrades. And it will be all very late in the game, 1979, that Lechien Etzel uh, fighters would, would, would gain these, these commemorations. But, but in a way, it is part of an ongoing debate, cultural debate that is very much mapped on Israeli political debates. You know, the example is the work of Woody Lebel, who's a professor at the Ariel University that writes about the long road to the Pantheon and how the labor Zionists always excluded us and we were the silver platter and actually these Ben-Gurion authoritarian leaders never allowed us. So, they, so that's part of the dynamic using Mossi's uh, methodological empathy. This is the way the Israeli right sees itself as fighting a liberal fight against the Ben-Gurionish authoritarian way of orchestrating the state, including its commemoration culture and excluding us who are fighting. And, and that, of course, Ras, thank you so much that you are absolutely correct that, that the labor Zionist pantheon very, owes much to the Socialism realisti, realism socialisti, right? The, the, the classic tropes of, of Soviet East European uh, um, uh, modes of, of, uh, um, of, of, of commemoration. So you're right that there's something about of a blind spot in, in assuming that Central European German uh, uh, modes of commemoration are, um, uh, would be the main ones. You're, I, I take your point that that's a good, uh, a very incisive point.
Good. Um, so maybe we'll begin with um, with irony and um, ridicule in, in regarding his own sense of belonging uh, in Israel. I think, you know, listening to nationalist songs and getting goosebumps is one thing, and writing about it is, is quite another. Um, and in this regard, it's sort of telling that both the Gellner quote that I used and the Benedict Anderson were statements that they gave impromptu in, in, in an interview, but Marcy chose to integrate those things, to weave those things in um, into um, his memoir intentionally. Um, so I think that is, uh, uh, that shows a great sense of irony, not irony, but um, sharing the, um, yeah, maybe it is irony or a degree of uh, self-deprecation regarding that I sh really shouldn't be feeling those things, but I do. So I'm not going to cover it up, but but uh, but um, uh, mention it. Of course, you know, uh, I think it was quite evident that even though Marcy felt at home in Israel, no one would mistake him for a kibbutznik, right? So in this regard, he didn't have like the um, the Arik Lavi situation of a self-made sabra. So there was maybe, I assume, less place for jokes, but those who knew him personally, uh, and not just through books, um, will probably know um, better. Um, Regarding the question of how did Mossy write the history of Zionism, a few things come to mind. Um, one, uh, the earlier manifestation of that is um, things like including those Zionist protagonists in conversations that the average uh, 20th century person or uh, second half of the 20th century a uh, scholar of history would not necessarily know that, you know, that Jews were participating in the Borden Reform uh, movement or other illiberal or folkish uh, conversations. So, of course, there's something very provocative uh, uh, about that. Um, the other thing, the entirely completely, because the complete other end, which actually also chronologically is something that you see more in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, is an exploration of early uh, early Zionists by nationalists and the like. Now everyone writes about the national by nationalists, but uh, no, no, no. Following Marcy, right? So, so, so Marcy did it way uh, earlier than others. I mean, some people did, but the, the but the this discussion of this uh, reflection on Israeli history through mainly the writings of the so-called founding fathers, sort of trying to make a case through those texts, things that were in th throughout the generations um, marginalized and rendered, as it were, obsolete and irrelevant um, in, uh, in, in, in Zionist ideology are suddenly you know, summoned back in order to offset uh, a few things. And of course, there's a, there's a critical edge to it as well. And of course, and this is something that David Sorkin uh, has mentioned um, uh, in, in his panel, of course, there's an intervention in Jewish historiography vis-a-vis -vis Zionist historiography, Jerusalem School, um, 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 Dubnov students, um, um, as it were. So that's another thing. How do I go about Hans Bluer? Hans Bluer is a very tough question, and I do not know the answer. So the point of the matter is, the centrality of the openly gay, and I would even say gay activist, uh, Hans Bluer in the story of uh, German folkism. He, as yeah, you all know, was uh, the historiography, a very important um, conservative revolutionary intellectual and the, historio the, the, um, the historian of the um, Van der Vogel. Um, Mossy, I know, as of the 30s, was very aware of the homophobic uh, discussions among anti-fascists that hoped to present or tried to present Nazism as some kind of um, homosexual um, cabal. Um, Th that knowledge sits much better with what Mossy writes later on as of national sexuality and on. In his presentation of Bleuer, 
there's, there is a degree of ridicule, and you always wonder as you read it, is it trying to put some doubt, a question mark on the respectability of Hans Bluer on, uh, by presenting those ideas? I do not know the answer. I know it's sensitive. I'm putting it out there. I would love to hear comments from people now or later. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I'm a liquid. <laughs>